Hi, and welcome to the 11th lecture of the wireless communication course. Today we will talk about Massive MIMO and 5G. In this slide we will try to see where we are in the course. So, as you recall, we first saw the first part, which was dealing with the wireless channel. Here we saw uh, what is um, the channel comprised, which is path loss, shadowing and multipath fading. And for multipath fading we saw narrowband and wideband channels. Then we spent three lectures to assess the performance and optimization of that performance of, over wireless channels. In lecture five, we talk about the communication performance in terms of symbol error rates, and we saw that wireless channels are much worse than additive white Gaussian noise channels so for the same SNR. And to mitigate this, we saw how to use diversity techniques to boost the effective SNR at the receiver, and also to do water filling to boost the rate and to make use of the good channels with more power and higher order constellations. Excuse me. Then we saw three uh, lectures on different technologies and methods. We saw one lecture on OFDM, which allows you to increase your transmission rate and at the same time create multiple parallel channels to avoid complex receiver equalization. OFDM, um, by creating parallel channels in frequency, you are also able to exploit uh, water filling and, of course, diversity. In lecture 9, we talk about multi-user communication. We saw duplexing, FDD and TDD, which is a separation between uplink and downlink. And then we saw different multiple access schemes, <coughs> TDMA, FDMA and CDMA. We also learn about uh, when multiple base stations are active at the same time, how to do frequency reuse. And we also saw a little bit about power control. In the last lecture, you learn about MIMO. Uh, we saw the general MIMO model, both in line of sight and as well as uh, the, the really fading model. We saw what you should do at the receiver when the, the channel state information is only available at the, trans at the receiver, but not the transmitter. And then we also saw how to do singular value decomposition to exploit channel state information at the transmitter side. So this ended part three. We are now in the last part of the course, the advanced topics. In this lecture now, we will talk about 5G and massive MIMO, and then there's one more lecture on radio localization. Now this last lecture will be of a slightly different format because I pre-recorded it as part of a, a winter school where I presented a two hour lecture on this topic. So the format will be a little bit different, but I hope it will still be interesting for you. Anyway, today is 5G and massive MIMO. Last time, you learned about the narrowband MIMO channel. Uh, we saw that the channel model is always the same, Y is HX plus N. When the receiver is only one who has channel state information, we saw different detectors, maximum likelihood, zero forcing, and minimum mean square error. When the transmitter has channel knowledge, we can apply SVD to create spatial streams. And SVD is given by this expression, U sigma V Hermitian, where U and V are Unitary matrices, sigma is a diagonal matrix with uh, non-negative, well, with positive real values, or ranks from high to low. The number of spatial streams is decided by us, but is limited by the rank of sigma or the rank of the underlying channel. Here is a, well, a side question. If you have a circle in channel matrix, what is the SVD? Uh, you, you can try this, and I think you will find that U and V will be the, the DFT or the FFT matrices. Anyway, um, this is how the SVD works. You have your symbols that you sent over the channel. These are transformed by performing pre-coding. So your data symbols are these X tilde. You multiply with V do that, that you call X, send over the channel, you obtain Y. You do receiver side shaping by using U Hermitian and then you obtain Y tilde. And then you can find that y tilde of the k stream is the k singular value times the k transmitted symbol plus noise. The number of streams that is supported is determined by the rank of the channel RH. And here is sigma, which is listing all the non all the zero, uh, singular values from large to small, and at some point there will be a bunch of zeros. And you can choose how many of these singular values that you use. You can use only the first one, and this is called beamforming. In case we uh, have a certain delay spread in the channel, we work in the wideband regime that we combine MIMO with OFDM, which means we have, a, we have synchronized OFDM transmitters at all the antennas, synchronized OFDM receivers at all the antennas, 
And then we obtain per sub carrier a simple MIMO model as before, which is the narrowband MIMO model for sub carrier K. We just have a whole bunch of these. Now let's switch to the topics for this lecture. We will talk about the key technologies of, of um, 5G. We'll spend just one slide again revisiting MIMO capacity or two slides of MIMO capacity. And then we go into two major topics. The first one is multi-user MIMO and the last one is massive MIMO, which is one of the 5G key technologies. <clears throat> now the topics for today are not really covered in the book. They're the more advanced topics. So even though you can read section 14.9 on the book, I recommend that you read these uh, three papers on 5G. I think they provide a good introduction to this um, lecture and also some of the topics I, I took from these papers. Today's learning outcomes, you should, you should be able to describe the characteristics of 5G, the difference between single user MIMO and multi user MIMO, express both multi user, uh, sorry, express multi user MIMO in both uplink and downlink as a standard MIMO system. Explain the benefit of massive MIMO in terms of having nearly orthogonal channels and also describe the meaning of pilot contamination. So 5G in contrast to 4G is characterized by a wide range of uh, scenarios for which it will be used. And each of these scenarios will have different requirements. So if you want me to zoom in a little bit, they talk here about sensor networks. Uh, where you will have limit, limited data rates, but maybe very long battery life. You have mission critical broadcast, autonomous driving, or robotic control, VR as well, where you will uh, have very low latency communication and possibly also high rate. Then you have uh, kind of traditional consumer applications, high rate video, cloud working. Here you mainly care about high rate and maybe less about scalability and latency and now if we look here these are then categorized into three categories massive broadband which is kind of the standard 4g but just faster massive machine type communication which is more sensor networks long battery life but lower rate and if here finally critical machine type communication uh, with very low latency for instance autonomous driving where you need to react within milliseconds and you see then on this spectrum some of the different performance metrics. So you have here very long battery life, high data rate, many devices, um, more traffic, very reliable transmissions. Well, these are some of the use cases that are foreseen. If we look a little bit deeper. So the use cases, as I mentioned, are um, enhanced mobile broadband, low latency and mach massive machine type communication. And with each of these are different uh, KPIs or key performance indicators. And based on, on which of these three use cases you're considering, you, you will have different values of these performance indicators. <clears throat> so for instance, reliability is very important for this ultra reliable low latency communication. And here, for instance, they specify 10 to the minus five probability. Okay, what does it say? Yeah, 10 to the minus five, by well, one minus 10 to the minus five success probability or 10 to the minus five failure probability. And I don't want to go into to all of these in detail. What is interesting for a communication engineer is how can we meet those requirements? Because it's easy to set requirements, but it's harder to then develop the technologies to meet them. And here are a few ways of how this, this is being done in 5G. And some of these are already deployed and some of these will be deployed in the coming years. The first one is more bandwidth and well the only way we can get more bandwidth is by going to higher carrier frequencies so in 5g frequencies up to 24 gigahertz will be considered and this is called the millimeter wave regime another technology technological enabler is to use more antennas and this is, will be called the massive mimo where we equip the base stations but not a user with hundreds of antennas and we will mainly talk about this in this lecture Another enabler is to use more base stations, which means I will have shorter distance to the user, so higher SNR, and this is called, for instance, femtocells or picocells. So basically base stations that cover a very small uh, area. And then we will also consider new kind of signals and new codes, for instance, for short packets, and one type of code that has been recently introduced is, for instance, polar codes. And there are many other enablers depending at the level of granularity that you want to go into. But to today we will really focus on, I think, what is the most important one is massive MIMO. 
Millimeter wave is also important. We will talk a little bit about it today, but this will be mainly um, described in the next lecture on radio localization. Good. So as I said, we will focus on uh, massive MIMO, but in order to understand massive MIMO, we need to go back to a simpler version of that, which is called multi-user MIMO. And to understand multi-user MIMO, we should revisit the MIMO capacity. In the last lecture, we briefly talked about this. So today we will go over this again and maybe in a little bit more detail. So in this slide, I talk about the capacity of the MIMO channel and we will have a narrow band model here. If we have my, uh, wide band, we will assume OFDM, so where this model occurs over every subcarrier. So the model is again Y is HX plus N. There's a certain covariance of the transmit signal with a certain total power and the noise is quite in space and in time. The only free parameter here is rho, which is a measure of the signal to noise ratio. We can perform a singular value decomposition of this channel, in, case we, in which case we have RH non-zero singular values and the other ones are all zero. In general, the channel capacity is given by this expression. This is the general channel capacity equation for the MIMO channel where the channel is fixed. The channel capacity is the, basically the same as for the um, SISO capacity. The only thing that's different is this determinant here and the fact that you have matrices inside of the expression. Oops. If we accept this expression, then we can compute the channel capacity in two cases, one where only the receiver knows the channel, the other one where the transmitter knows the channel. When the receiver knows the channel, then the only reasonable thing to do is to split the power among all the transmit antennas. So each of the antennas gets one mt of rho, so rho over mt. We can then plug this inside of this expression. We, through the singular value decomposition of h, we find that H, H Hermitian is U Hermitian sigma squared U, and sigma squared is of course a diagonal matrix where all of these elements are done squared. We then plug this in, we find this expression. Now, since this is a diagonal matrix, this whole thing simplifies uh, to this expression here. Now here, everything is a diagonal matrix and the determinant of a diagonal matrix is just the product of the elements on the diagonal, which gives me this, right? So one plus rho sigma i squared over mt. This is this one. Logarithm of a product gives me a sum of the logarithms. So this is my final capacity expression. So the capacity when only the receiver knows the channel is obtained by sending equal power over all transmit antennas. And the capacity is this expression, the bandwidth sum over all of the spatial streams, log one plus the SNR of that spatial stream. When the transmitter knows the channel, it can do water filling over the parallel channel. So it will use a different transmit covariance matrix to do water filling, and then the capacity expression normally, uh, automatically becomes like this. So we have again a sum over all of the spatial streams, but the difference is where here we give each stream the same transmit power, here we adapt the transmit power per stream subject to a total power constraint. And this is exactly the scenario that we had in, in bit loading. Well, I won't cover this here. In, in general, the, the channel capacity can also be evaluated when the channel is random, right? Because we've seen Rayleigh fading models and other fading models, in which case there are different um, capacity notions such as average capacity and outage capacity. Now, a question that you may ask yourself is, what is the best possible capacity you, you can achieve if you have only channel-state information at the receiver? So this is the case of CSIR. And suppose that the total power inside of the channel, which is the trace of sigma squared, so the sum of the non-singular values, is fixed and grows linearly with the number of receive and transmit antennas. So suppose that the channel has a fixed energy, but this energy will grow as a number, as function of the number of antennas. And then we consider two cases, the line of sight case and the rich non-line of sight case. In the line of sight case, we know that there is only one zero, one non-zero singular value. So recall from the previous lecture, in the line of sight case, we know that the channel is alpha a theta a transpose phi and then the non-zero singular value, there's only one of them and all the rest will be zero. 
right? And then this non-zero singular value will be mr mt square root, right? Because we have this constraint. So that means b remains, this sum is gone, only one term remains. But for this term, we will have this sigma squared i as mr by mt, and then we've the, the, only the this remains. So the mt is removed in denominator and numerator. This is our capacity expression. So this means when we increase our number of receive antennas, the capacity grows logarithmically with the number of antennas. On the other hand, if you have a rich non-line-of-sight channel, so this is, for instance, when you have lots of scatters around the receiver, then the singular values will be like this. So let's see. This was for the line-of-sight case, and now in red I will do for the non-line-of-sight case. Then ideally all of the non-zero singular values, they will all have the same value, uh, which will be, and now I should be careful, uh, m r m t over the minimum of m r m t something like this all right so you divide up this total power in the channel over all of the singular values if you then plug this into this equation so each of these terms will have the same value because each of the sigmas is the same so you will have r h and now r h is given by the minimum of m r of m m t so this is here the same as RH. And then each of these will have the same signal to noise ratio, which will be the maximum of MRF MT and MT of over MT. And you can easily verify this yourself. And now it can be shown, but we don't do this, that in the general case, the capacity of any other channel, so one that's not line of sight or very rich non line of sight, lies in between those two extreme cases. And the larger case is obtained on the right side here with the rich scattering environment. So what this means is that if we have a choice to operate in line of sight or in rich non-line of sight with these with this fixed energy constraint, then we prefer to have a rich scattering environment. And in this fixed rich scattering environment, we have a linear scaling of the capacity with a number of antennas. And this is very important and very different, for instance, for this line of sight case. So here, by putting more antennas, we only have a logarithmic scaling. So this means if we have here MR or MT, and then the capacity. In the line of sight case, we have a logarithmic scaling, but in the rich scattering case, we have a linear scaling. So linear logarithmic. So this is what we prefer, and we don't like logarithmic scaling. Oh, ah, wrong button. So what we care about at the end of the day now is that if we have a choice, we prefer to have rich scattering because this is what, what will give us the best possible capacity with this total fixed energy constraint. With this now in mind, we go on to multi-user MIMO after the break.